Set a cardboard box in front of any adult and they'll ask you, what do you want me to do with it? It's a cardboard box. Set this very same box in front of a three-year-old or a third grader and suddenly he or she sees it as a spaceship, a dollhouse, a robot, or a race car. But then it happens. It seems sudden, unexpected. Our children no longer see the spaceship in the cardboard box. They no longer imagine the possibilities, and instead they ignore the potential of its simplicity. And the adults around don't seem too alarmed. Besides, it's a cardboard box. We may view this slight suppression of creativity and imagination as a signal, a pre-entry into the real world, a slice of reality, if you will. But there's something more deep, more unfortunate happening to our society with a slight suppression of the imagination, or as I see it, an erosion. Creativity is nurtured in relationships and the expression of what is viewed as beautiful, valued, and belonging. Science, technology, engineering, and math are defined by the nature of the relationships between their subject matter concepts and the resulting creation. But what happens in a society that limits the boundaries of its relationships by limiting who belongs? Creativity becomes boxed in. Technology's purpose is to improve the human condition. But sometimes the human condition can get in the way of technology's purpose. It's in situations like these we need to innovate with people and not just with technology. As an African-American child growing up with five siblings in a two-bedroom trailer, society may not have viewed me as someone with lots of potential and promise, nor belonging in technology. Since there weren't enough rooms for beds for everyone, my mom would lovingly place me in a cardboard box at night to sleep as a baby. My dad, a military veteran, moved us to a side of town into this converted railroad boarding house. And this side of town was known for its drug trafficking and crime. And we didn't have a lot of money for toys, so I would use my imagination and make toys out of anything I could find from the nearby railroad yard, the junkyard, or go to the public library and find books on how I could do science experiments in our kitchen. I would take cardboard boxes and try to become Iron Man. I would build forts. I would dream up spaceships and robots. Little did I know that one day I would become a professor that would teach robotics to students and how to program these robots to help people. Since I've had these life experiences, I can see the potential in any boy or girl, regardless of their background, regardless of their race, regardless of their family situation, to belong in technology. And I've had a handful of life encounters, very sig significant encounters, that have taught me why I believe anyone can belong in technology, including a serendipitous encounter with Steve Jobs. My first encounter well, each of these encounters, actually, they became a crossroad for me to decide whether I was going to let people put me in a box of low expectations, fear, or ignorance, or to believe that I could live outside that box in the realm of achievement, potential, and unlimited possibilities. So my first encounter happened when I was a PhD graduate student in electrical engineering at the University of Kansas. Go Jayhawks. <laughs> I was attending a National Science Foundation Engineering Education Scholars Program at a Big Ten Research University. And while visiting the computer science department there, the department chair told me, oh, we would never hire you. You didn't go to the right school. I didn't belong there, so he said. 
I could have let that box that he had created in his mind stop me, but he was actually right. I didn't belong there. Instead, his Big Ten rival, the University of Iowa, <laughs> go Hawkeyes, <laughs> hired me as an assistant professor in electrical and computer engineering. And there I began an academic journey where I thrived and eventually received a distinguished chair position at Marquette University. My second encounter occurred after reading The Purpose Driven Life and taking a position at Spelman College, historically black college for women, in Atlanta, Georgia. There at Spelman, I started a team of robotic students called the Spellbots, and we competed in the uh, RoboCup competition. So RoboCup is the, the World Cup of robots. And this past year was held in Brazil, and we had a team from Marquette that attended. But the goal of RoboCup is by the year 2050 to have a team of humanoid robots that could beat the World Cup soccer team. <laughs> and hopefully by then, it'll be the United States. <laughs> and, and also to use the technology to, to develop robots that smart to assist humans, including the elderly and persons with disabilities. So on one fall day, when we were beginning a new year with the Spellbots team, these two first-year students, Janice and Jasmine, showed up. They were both bright and cheery and both eager to learn. Um, one wore braces. They both had never programmed in high school. Janice was a championship caliber cheerleader in high school, and Jasmine was an avid anime fan and Taekwondo enthusiast. And and so we taught them how to program. And after that, they loved learning how uh, to program robots to dance and to play soccer. So the next year, when they were sophomores, they were co-captains of our Spellbots team. And they programmed all the computer vision, the motion for like kicking the ball, the locomotion for walking, and the artificial intelligence to make decisions to play two-on-two -two or three-on-three robot soccer automatically without remote controls. Now, this was no easy task. In fact, it took them hours upon hours of programming and grappling with graduate level engineering and computer science topics. In 2009, we competed in the RoboCup Japan Open in Osaka, Japan, against a team from Fukuoka Institute of Technology. And we reached the championship match and we came out with a tie after the penalty kick shootout. <laughs> so we were all excited and ready to go to the award ceremony and hear our team's name announced and talk, uh, have them announce the tie. And so we went there and we waited and it never happened. They never announced our tie. They never announced our team's name. In so many ways they were telling us we didn't belong. My third encounter that I'll share with you happened in 2007. The Spellbots were invited to speak at Stanford University's Clayman Institute for Gender Research. So while we were in Silicon Valley, of course we wanted to go visit Google. And so we got to go visit Google for breakfast, and we got to go visit Apple at lunch. <laughs> Google's lunch was free, and Apple's we had to pay for. But actually, our friends that we met at Apple paid for our lunch. Um, one of the friends is, uh, her name is Denise, and she's now a vice president. She's an African-American woman. And then also Scott, he was a recruiting manager there. And so all of a sudden, while we're in Cafe Max, Scott leans over to me and says, don't look now. Here comes Steve Jobs with Johnny Ives. And of course, I looked. <laughs> And I knew I wasn't supposed to go up to Steve Jobs, so I went up to Johnny Ives. <laughs> and I introduced myself, hoping that Steve would come up and see what was going on. And sure enough, Steve comes up, and I say, hi, I'm Andrew Williams from Spelman College, a historically black college for women, and Apple supports our robotics team. Do you have engineering there, he said. 
I said, well, we have a dual engineering program with schools like Georgia Tech and University of Michigan. Can you help us hire black engineers? Do you know how many black engineers we have at Apple? And before I could say anything, he said, one. <laughs> and this next statement, you have to use your imagination and fill in the blank because he used much stronger language and I want to keep a G rating on this talk. <laughs> he said, we are doing a blank job of hiring black engineers at Apple. If you have any ideas, send me an email at sjobs at apple.com. So I go home, back to Atlanta, excited that he cared so much about African American engineers and hiring them at Apple. And so I thought about it, I prayed about it, what I should write in my email to him. So I told him in my email as I was typing why I do what I do. And I even included a picture of my family who are seated right up here. <laughs> I couldn't do anything with my, without my lovely wife, Anitra. <laughs> and then I proceeded to write what I, I thought Apple was doing good in terms of improving its diversity and what I thought Apple needed to do from the top down to improve. And I sent the email to Steve and I figured he would never write back. I wasn't even sure if he was going to read it. Well, he didn't write back, but a week later, Scott, my friend, the recruiting manager, had received a couple emails from him. And one of the emails said, this makes me so happy. I think we should hire him to help us hire black engineers. And, and so I ended up taking a sabbatical from Spelman and becoming Apple's first senior engineering diversity manager. They actually made up that position for me. <laughs> and my message to Apple became, innovate with people, not just with technology. My last encounter. Just last month, I was walking out the front door of my home in a neighboring suburb of Milwaukee, and I saw a police car. I just keep walking down the driveway to my backyard, and then I noticed that a police officer had followed me to my backyard. And he asked me, did I live there? And I answered. And then he said, well, he got a call about a suspicious person in the neighborhood. And the person was wearing a yellow shirt. My family and I had lived there for two years, and I had on a red shirt. And then I was thinking to myself, I he thinks that I don't belong in my own neighborhood, in my own home. How crazy is that? And then it dawned on me. I began to question how dangerous and deadly it could be not belonging. And I questioned whether people like Michael Brown and other young African Americans in the news recently had their lives interrupted because someone viewed them as not belonging. But then what have the other children told that they don't belong because of the color of their skin, because they didn't go to the right school, because their gender doesn't match up to society's expectations? What then becomes of the dreamer, the creative spirit, the visionary, when crushed by these daily messages that they don't belong? America suffers. The United States is, is facing a severe shortage of technology creators. According to information found on the uh, website for the National Center for Women and Information Technology, in eight years there will be 1.2 million computer-related job openings and not enough U.S. workers to fill them. According to last month's U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics job report, there are currently 1.2 million unemployed African American women. 1.2 million computer-related job openings, 1.2 million unemployed African American women. The math is simple. These women and men represent an unseen, untapped gold mine of human potential that's trainable and talented 
and vital for our United States economy and our global competitiveness. Why not we encourage, equip, and educate one million African American, Hispanic, and Native American women and men in computer-related technology to fill this vital need for technology creators? One more thing. In March 2011, I got a call from Janicia, our former co-captain of our Spellbots team, and she was finishing her second degree at an Ivy League engineering school. She was frustrated because she couldn't get an internship at Apple, and I had already returned to Spelman from my sabbatical. And she said that she had interviewed there before, but they told her, in essence, that she didn't belong there. And this was in spite of the fact that Janicia and Jasmine created an iPhone app and won AT&T's national mobile, big mobile on campus challenge that a year before a team from Harvard had won and a year before a team from Stanford. So I said, send me your resume. I know the perfect person to send that resume to. <laughs> so I proceeded to write my last email to Steve Jobs. I told him simply that he and his family were in my prayers because he had recently announced that he was stepping down as CEO and I was getting emotional because I knew what that meant. I also attached my email, uh, uh, Janice's email, her resume to the email and also an email that I had written to other Apple employees about why I believed Janice belonged at Apple. So the next week, Janicia calls me on the phone. She's excited and happy. And she said that Apple, a recruiter had called from Apple to schedule an interview for an internship. And she said, the recruiter said, oh, by the way, we got your resume from Steve Jobs. <laughs> so of course she gets the internship. And later on, she gets a permanent position as an iOS software engineer. I talked to her last week, and she told me that she just finished re-architecturing Apple's EasyPay scanner app that you and everyone else around the world, millions of people that, that buy an iPhone or iMac or iPad in an Apple retail store will use. So now you can see the face behind the technology. So why is it so important that everyone can belong and believes that they can belong in technology? And why is it so vital to releasing creativity within people? I believe Steve Jobs lived it and said it best, as quoted in an interview with Wired Magazine in 1996. He said, creativity is just connecting things. But a lot of people in our industry haven't had very diverse experiences. So they don't have enough dots to connect. And they come up with very linear solutions without a broader perspective on the problem. The broader one's understanding of the human experience, the better design we will have. So I ask you, what do you see?